Hello, and welcome to the Mobile User Acquisition Show, a podcast to help you unlock tremendous growth for your app. My name is Shaman Rao. I'm the CEO of the boutique growth marketing firm, Rocketship HQ, and host of the podcast, Mobile User Acquisition Show. In each episode, we feature experts in the field of mobile growth and discuss strategies, tips, and pointers from the leading edge of mobile growth marketing. By the end of each episode, you will have gained actionable and tactical insights that will help you make more informed decisions in your own work around growth. The Mobile User Acquisition Show is produced by Meryl Vincent, Content Marketing Manager at Rocketship HQ. Our guest today is John Hook, CMO at Play Ember, a hyper-casual game development studio in the Web2 and Web3 space. Today's episode is a rebroadcast from our earlier podcast, How Things Grow. In this episode that was recorded much before ATT, we dive into the hypercasual phenomenon. In this interview, John talks about the rise of the hypercasual games, the drivers and forces powering them, the future that he saw ahead at the time, and he offers some fascinating insights into one of the more unexpected occupants of the app stores. Even though ATT has changed the landscape of the app stores, this episode gives a fascinating view of the ascent of an unexpected, unprecedented genre and the forces that propel the app store economy. John, welcome to How Things Grow. Thanks, Thanks for having me. Absolutely. And this is a conversation I've been wanting to have for a long time as background for some of our listeners. As of this weekend, the top five games on the iTunes App Store included Call of Duty, Icing on the Cake, Mario Kart Tour, Drop and Smash, Draw Race. So two proven IPs that have had decades of investment and three that seem almost frivolous in their nature. And this, of course, is the phenomenon, hyper casual, that we're here to talk about today. And John is among the best people to talk about hyper casual, just because he's been in so deep and worked on so many games that are such huge, huge hits. So John, to start off, tell us what hyper casual is as a genre of games. I always think it's a good question, and I'll tell you why. Because if you say hyper-casual to most people outside of hyper-casual, they'll think of something like Flappy Bird, or it will conjure up an image of you know people in their bedroom making really low-quality games that maybe hit the charts for a few days and disappear. But I think there's two ways to look at what hyper-casual is. First, by the audience type. So we're talking about like mass-market games audience they 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 don't really identify as gamers versus say you know more like mid-core or hardcore gamers and as a result it is confusing because if you look in the app store hyper casual isn't yet an app store category um you know it permeates multiple categories puzzle casual action racing but most games are usually classed as either arcade or casual so if you look at your phone i suspect there probably is a hyper casual game on that the reference point i always give is is netflix for me hyper casual is netflix you know you you log in and whatever you want to watch there is a great piece of content i.e a hyper casual game for you but of course outside of the audience there are certain ways that you can spot a hyper casual game so, you know, by the publisher, there are some some really top publishing hyper casual games, but also by the game mechanic and gameplay. So typically in hyper casual, we talk about a one tap game. You'll hear the word snack games. It needs to be really easy to understand. I call it the nan test. So if my if my nan can play one of our games and understand it within two seconds, that's really easy to understand, really easy to play and non-punitive. So in no way do you feel like you're being punished for not succeeding. And you'll see the hyper casual games, it's so adaptive now. If you don't pass a level and you play it again, the level won't be the same, it'll be even easier because it wants you to succeed. And it's a game that everyone can play. So the the hit recipe is snackable, YouTubeable, nice and straightforward, punitive. So that makes sense if you think about 
the market that you're building these games for that aren't gamers it all fits yeah. in yeah and i think the one word that you use that was interesting to me that I'd like to dig into further down this interview is non-punitive. But I will also point out that the concept of hyper-casual games, as you described them, isn't radically new. A lot of the arcade games of the 70s and 80s had mechanics that we would come to identify as hyper-casual in today's world. Space Invaders, Tetris, and Pong are all games that I remember playing and that those all seem to have a lot of similarities to games that we would think of as hyper-casual today. Yet, the first wave of mobile games, let's say 2008 to 2015, did not have these games. So with your understanding, why do you think these games were absent in that first wave and what precipitated the ascent of hyper-casual after 2015? Everyone, if you think back, has got that kind of nostalgic memory of the earliest hyper-casual games. You know, from here, it's actually like Snake on the Nokia 3310, that kind of yeah. single tap, yeah. grow mechanic, easy to play. To your question, if we, if we take that point, these games have always been around. What is it that's really accelerated this in, in recent years? So I think there's, the first thing for me is the human element. So what I mean by that is with smartphones, they've democratized gaming. So if you think this classic stereotype of, you know, early on, like there's PC gamers and what we just discussed about the hyper casual audience are not gamers. Well, with, with your smartphone, you remove that barrier, that stereotype of, well, no, I, I am a gamer. I've got my console. I've got my PC. I've all got my equipment around it. I'm just a mobile phone owner. So I, I think that coupled with the other simple human trend that our attention span is decreasing you know you hear yeah. stats of like 10 seconds seven seconds is the average length of human attention yeah. so look at the rise of facebook instagram now tiktok snapchat we're being conditioned to consume content in bite-sized forms yeah. so if you put those two elements together it's no surprise that hyper casual has exploded because it just fits into human nature most yeah. people on the planet have a smartphone everyone's got short attention spans they're expecting yeah. short form snackable yeah. in content and hyper casual to tick that box so for me the second part is it's the technology advancements and i know we're going to touch on this so i won't go into too much detail but yeah. i think that just the speed of innovation in game design a monetization that have enabled these mass market games to ensure that the economics now work, that you can advertise and acquire so many users and run a very profitable business. So for me, it's the kind of simple maths that we'll talk into around sort of IPMs and LTV. But I think some of these great kind of startups that are powering the hyper casual industry combined with the kind of human element and democratization of gaming that have just seen this explosion of hyper casual. Sure. And um sounds like in many ways the last couple of years have brought forth quite the perfect storm in that there's been a large-scale proliferation of smartphones and people have been more and more open to snackable bite-sized experiences and that's the wave that hyper casual has been quite on top of john we've talked about how hyper casual has quite taken over the app stores certainly and in very many respects public imagination just because they are so front and center in the app store can you give a sense of how big the market is are there numbers you can share about how much hyper casual games have proliferated our phones today so if we go back to what we just discussed about hyper casual being mass market community quite simply you're talking a total addressable market of anyone that owns a smartphone. So you're talking about billions of people. It's incredible. Yeah. If we actually talk about the reality of where we are right now, so the hyper casual industry is estimated to have a value of around about two and a half billion dollars in, in 2019. Mm -hmm. In terms of users, I've seen some great stats from Tengen who are saying that in 2019 we'll hit 860 million monthly active users. So that's up 68% on 2018, where it was 510 million. But if you look at the speed of growth in three years, if we go back to 2016, that number of MAU tension recorded as 65 million. So in three years, 
to get from 65 million to 860 million. That's over a thousand percent growth in three years. It's incredible. Again, it is a global audience. So one market of real interest right now to all hyper casual developers and publishers is China, roughly according to Appani. So 30% of all games downloaded in China are hyper casual games already. Yeah. And I believe that figure will be closer to 50% in the next couple of years. It's already, for people that don't work in hyper-casual, these figures are quite astounding when you hear these kind of figures. And I think another important fact in terms of market size, which is really key, so when we look at our games, uh, OMA games, we, we see a rough 50-50 split of, between male and female. And that really surprises a lot of people. Again, coming back to the stereotype of gaming being very male dominated, it's actually slightly skewed in favor of female to male. So that's a really important point. It's not just sort of total addressable smartphone orders that are male age 18 to 44. I think that gives you a size of where the industry is at and yeah. the fact that it's still growing exponentially in some areas. And in some countries, and we'll talk about this a bit later, specifically China, hypercasual is still just in its infancy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those are humongous numbers. And like you said a lot of hypercasual games have an MAU right now of 860 million. So by that comparison, more people play hypercasual games than are active on some of the social networks, more than Twitter and Snapchat, certainly. So that's a very, very humongous stat as is the growth rate that you just alluded to. I'm curious though, in your background, you ran an agency a couple of years ago, you worked in ad sales. When did you see that hyper-casual was a thing? It could be the huge force that it is today. And what brought you to hyper-casual? It's an interesting question when I kind of look back and we've already talked about the kind of nostalgia of Tetris and yeah. uh, Snake on the Nokia. So it's, it's kind of been this thing that's always been there. It's just never had this classification. Yeah. So you've obviously had the rise of gaming, but more if I think about it from an ad perspective and particularly brands, I spent a lot of time working with brands, helping them understand gaming. But the kind of default was kind of the, the great team at sort of King, now Activision with sort of Candy Crush, who were kind of leading the charge on trying to really bring brands into gaming and help them understand. But I, I guess at Ad Colony where... When you start seeing sort of new names, new developer, new publisher names, driving crazy volumes in terms of like impressions, that's when you start paying attention and doing your homework on, right, who are these people? When you see more and more of them, that's when you start to realize that there's something very exciting happening here under the surface. And, and I think the other thing that really struck me from the kind of supply side, when I look at the analogies of how like a lot of the raw water video guys operate in a, in a network, every impression has a value. So if one game doesn't work, it doesn't matter. The, the platform will optimize. And what I started to see is it's a very really similar way of thinking in the way that the hyper casual world works exactly the same that every impression, every user has a potential value. So I actually saw there were some real similarities between working on businesses like Ad Colony and actually the way Hypercasual was functioning. And also the fact that a lot of what happens in Hypercasual is really led by, and I really like that because having spent a lot of time agency side, I've been very lucky to work with some incredible planners and creative thinkers. And what I learned from my agency days is, is even then, there is a lot of great thinking and tapping into human emotion, but a lot of it was still grounded in data and insight. Yeah. And when I look at what's happening in hypercasual, that is still true for hypercasual. There's no real different. Yes, we can get excited about a game or we see a prototype, but really it does come down to what the data says. And if the data isn't telling us that this could succeed, then we don't move forward. So actually when I, kind of looked at this before talking to you today. I, I think working you know, in an agency and spending a lot of time and always training under some great planners has really helped train my brain for working in hypercasual. Sure. So it sounds like you were looking at this data from publishers that were emerging and growing and really exploding in impression volume. And that started to tell you that, look, hypercasual could be a thing. You were grounded in the kind of data working on the agency side in the past. So that clued you in. 
I'm also curious though, did you wonder at the time, is this just a fad? Are there all these publishers that are exploding in volume that are buying up massive amounts of ad inventory, but is this another boom and bust thing that is going to happen? Did that cross your mind at any point? Yeah, I mean, of course, if you look at it within a certain time frame, you can then start thinking, oh, this is just a kind of boom. But if you look back at the context that we're thinking and look at that broader picture, yeah. then it doesn't look so much like a short term trend. It actually, yeah. if you go back to the early days, this has been something that has just been building, evolving with consumer behavior. And you've had the advances in technology. And then, you know, when you get there's there's a great the community within gaming, some great early stage funds. But you know, when, when you get Goldman Sachs investing $200 million into Voodoo, I, I think, one, it's a great validation of what the team of Voodoo are doing, but it really put hypercashal on the map from an investment community. I had a lot of friends at VCs calling me up saying, like, what's going on? Who is this, who are Voodoo? Who are hypercasual? And for me, that I find that really interesting because it tells me, obviously, you work in gaming and you get quite closed off to this because you just... You just know it's going to be big. You work in it every day, but to the outside world, you do forget how gaming is still perceived yeah. as really a kind of a main investment channel, a main channel that brands should be in. And to me, that's crazy. So I genuinely believe that was a big tipping point, certainly for hypercasual with sure. that money from Goldman pouring in. Sure. And of course, the data continues to show the consistent growth of hypercasual. I'm curious though, as you transitioned into hypercasual, what were some of the things you had to unlearn and what were some of the things you had to learn as you started to work on a completely new category, completely new genre at the time? Well, I think things that I've always applied, no matter what role I've been in from agency side to on the supply side to kind of launching startups, I think it's just a blank sheet of paper. There's always going to be things that you can bring with you, but when you create a new op a new opportunity, you should be always open to what can I learn, how can I do things differently. So that applied when I started in hypercasual. I was really excited about the opportunity to work with the kind of great team of entrepreneurs that are behind Oma, um, to bring some skills that I developed over the years, but also just learn something completely new. And I guess the the biggest change. I mean, we spoke earlier about kind of data-driven kind of planning from my agency days. But I, I guess in hypercasual and certainly the, the team at OMA, and we literally don't do anything unless there is data to back it up. So this could be from just a simple playable ad. It could be game design. It could be big data, campaign optimization. So I, I think just almost letting go of that like emotional side of your brain that exists and trying to just switch that off and, and purely just operating in a rational way because yeah. that, that is how you succeed in, in hypercasual. There's yeah. some other practical elements that are more specific to hypercasual. So things like, you know, the marketing level, like user acquisition channels. So obviously Facebook, Google, very dominant in other areas of gaming, but actually surprisingly in hypercasual, there are yeah. other UA channels that perform more effectively than Facebook and Google. So learning to work more deeply with those partners as we release yeah. more games. The same in terms of technology providers. Again, it's great conferences in the UA world and always enjoy listening to people, not just in gaming, but the non-gaming world to understand their tech stack. But again, because of the economics of hypercasual are very different, They're so heavily ad based, there's been some really fantastic kind of startups and, and growing technology partners that we've started to work with that until I worked in hypercasual, I hadn't done a lot of work with. Yeah. And also from a kind of personnel team structure perspective. So, for example, in hypercasual, UA and monetization, we don't have separate teams. That is the same person because we need right. to have that granular view tying kind of sort of user installs, user activity with revenue. So again, that was a little different. His friends in other categories that have got completely separate gaming, user acquisition and monetization teams. Yeah. So there, there are some things that are totally different and you have to learn pretty quickly. But yeah. I think if you've operated in an environment that is, so a lot of people that we're hiring for UA monetization are coming from, say, you know, investment banks, analysts, I think if you have a data analytical brain, hypercasual is something from a marketing perspective that is definitely something you should be looking at. Sure. 
And it's interesting how you spoke of how every decision you make is grounded in data. And I'm very curious to dig into that because if you read interviews of game designers or if you talk to game designers in the conventional sense, like people who had traditional conventional game design backgrounds, they speak a lot about how the story arc is important, how narratives are important, how emotion is so important. And if anything, the other two games in the top five that I alluded to, Call of Duty and Mario Kart Tour, I imagine they both lean very, very heavily on a lot of these emotional elements, right? And yet I've also heard, much like you said, that game design does not matter in hyper-casual. Can you elaborate on what that means, if that's a sentiment you agree with, right? And why game design in the conventional sense not mattering is actually very important for hyper-casual. Sure. So I'd say in the early days, not the 90s, but let's go back a couple of years, I would say that was kind of correct. That's how hyper-casual worked. It was all about market potential over game design, i.e. a tried and tested game mechanic that enables you, that has had some form of hit before. You can release games quicker than anyone else. And off you go. But I think now, I mean, a couple of weeks ago, I was in uh, for Pocket Gamer and uh, just two days immersed talking to developers. And both from a developer community world and also hyper casual, I, I definitely think that is changing. There are some publishers that that's true. They still will put market potential over game design. But I believe the way hyper casual is going, particularly when we start thinking about the retention, sort of hockey stick in hyper casual, there needs to be a real balance between game design and game art as well as its sort of market potential do the numbers stack up mm -hmm. so for me talking that we've already spoken about data but it's really exciting to work in this generation of kind of data driven creative game design because mm -hmm. if you're a hyper casual developer and you you've even got the faintest of my an idea you can really quickly test this out on real users to see if this is something that is even worth you putting time and effort into a prototype. Uh, so hyper casual has completely changed the whole concept of game design. But to your question why it's important, I think this is an obvious point to now dive into or just at least link it to user retention. So if you think about a top hyper casual game, day one we might see around say 40% retention, but day seven this drops to 15%. Now one way that you can obviously improve that is uh, that retention is game design and specifically uh, a good core loop so the heart of game design you've got your core mechanics and the gameplay loop so it's this the main activity that's going to structure the entire design and the players engaging repeatedly to create this looping sequence and a, for me a good core loop if you look at the hyper, hyper casual games and for any hyper casual players out there will know instantly what i mean but it's basically putting you in this state of flow so a bit like how netflix draws you yeah. in and within slightly different for netflix because it's going to take a bit longer you're in this you're, you're kind of hooked you're fully engaged the same with hyper casual but this good call loop it isn't born from an idea that you just implement and that you build on it, it's through kind of constant testing so you kind of pick an idea that's got potential you'll build a video ad to test it out yeah. on real players you evaluate the depth you can get off that and round and round you go so that for me is really important because there is this day seven challenge in hyper casual uh, that I'm hearing a lot about from all angles. And for me, uh, UA and monetization, that's the second step. But if you haven't nailed down the core game mechanic and game design, then you can have the best team when it comes to execution in terms of UA monetization. But if you don't have that, sure. that hit game, that, core loop that that's yeah. something new that you're bringing to game design then it's not really going to make a difference yeah so john tell me tell us about what game mechanics mean in the in the context of hyper casual and can you give us some examples of these sure so uh, a game mechanic really simply is just the the action of play right what are you getting the user to do over and over again within the context of the game are you asking to jump swerve so the mechanics in a game are often you know set up by the rules of the game so the challenge in a game would generally come from applying your game mechanics to certain situations so for example like walking around the game is the game mechanic whereas 
you know, a maze, for example, that's the kind of challenge that you're applying the game mechanic to. The kind of game mechanics, if you look at any hyper casual game, there are lots of different ones, but some kind of core ones. So there's a sort of tap or timing. So if you look at our game, Tiny Cars, you have to um, tap to stop the car so that it doesn't crash, for example. Mm -hmm. Then you'll have a sort of stacking or kind of turning mechanic type game that again if you look at sort of tower color it's throwing balls at a high stack of different shaped columns that you have to knock down or there's the sort of classic sort of rising falling mechanic that you know if you look at a voodoo helix jump for example that's fairly similar i mentioned one earlier so kind of a swerve mechanic so it might be just you're navigating a ball around a kind of a long track or some sort of car and then again we spoke earlier about the kind of nostalgic element and, and my memory certainly from snake and the nokia 3310 but some sort of growing mechanic and today you've got lots of different clones of that original snake game but that's another common one so i think there are lots more but those are some of the main ones that you'll see in hyper casual how do you identify what is a good code loop and how do you validate that what in your experience separates a good game from a great one it's a good question so it, what makes a good hyper casual game yeah. so again if we go back to a couple of years ago where we're talking about it's not so much about the the game itself it's more about can i market this game it's about perception so therefore it's not really about what the developer thinks about their game or the publisher it's really about what the data is saying can i acquire as many users as possible and get them to watch a certain number of ads that makes this game profitable. So really that takes the emotion out of it and you just really look at the data. But then what is interesting as well is each of the top publishers has a different angle on what they believe makes a top game. So, you know, some publishers still buy into, it's not about the perception. I don't think the quality of their games is as good, but they are charting incredibly highly because it has that mass market appeal. Whereas if you look at the style of some of the other top games in hyper casual, you can just see the quality is yeah. really, really high. Games are polished. They almost are merging or could, could be mistaken for a casual game. But in terms of what is going to make it a hit game, it really comes back to process, right? Yeah. And a lot of the mistakes that we see from hyper casual developers, it's something that actually they're easily solvable. So if you look at some simple mistakes, for example, it could be like a really simple choice of colors. So they're going against the trends of what we see in market. Well, yeah. again, if the game mechanic's good, but it's the wrong color, we'll be able to pick that up really quickly yeah. in the kind of testing phase. And we'll just see that, you know, purple versus green delivers a much more effective kind of LTV and brings the CPI down. We see, bear in mind a lot of hyper casual developers, some of them have never built a hyper casual game before. So one thing they might do is think, oh, I've just seen a great game, I'll simply copy the design. Uh, doesn't necessarily work. Or some of them are still sending in prototypes that are kind of like 2D, and generally 2D doesn't work. Yeah. Um, except maybe in puzzle. I, I, I love mistakes because that's something you learn from and i think that's the bigger picture of hyper casual is that there's so many developers now pouring into hyper casual because you know from a business perspective that's where you can make money maybe apple are going to change that with apple arcade if they can get a lot of these devs over there but yeah. a lot of the mistakes we see are just born from just people learning how to develop hyper casual games sure yeah and you know just to also dwell a little bit more on the validation process you touched upon from what i've read some publishers they build ads to validate games even before the game is fully built out. Is that something you guys do? What does a typical validation process yeah. of a game look like? So a developer will send us a concept in very different stages, but at the simplest form, they could send us a, a video, APK, test flight. You know, videos are, are better. Yeah. So we can just make sure... They're building something that, for example, we haven't seen already or tested already. But what happens is they'll send us a video or test flight, and then we'll test the game with real users. So we'll be able to see pretty quickly whether this is something that we can progress to the next stage. But generally, if it is a more advanced prototype, then we'll put it in the Facebook SDK and we'll test this in one country. We'll look at all aspects of the game. Mm -hmm. And in particular, we're looking at day one, day seven, average session time, 
And depending on the game performance, that initial process could take five to 10 days. Each publisher is going to have their own metrics or performance thresholds that you need to meet. And then it's really a question of working with the developer and feedback and making changes. Mm -hmm. And really at that point, that's when the developer and the publisher will get to a stage really of, of then negotiating sort of contract terms and how they're going to work together before you then proceed to the next phase, which is where yeah. you get onto a lot more heavier testing. So the game design team are going to recommend a pre-launch roadmap, prove the gameplay, new features, A-B testing, a monetization team will, will get involved and there'll be various mediation SDKs to implement. And if you don't have them in them already, you know, the major video SDKs like Vungle, Ad Colony, Unity, et cetera, along with the likes of Iron Source and Mopub. Yeah. So there's the, the very clear, that's what I love about Hybrid Casual. It's not just yeah. data focus, it's all about process. And for me, that excites me. If I'm a developer, for me, the, the kind of publishers I would look for are the ones that they're almost like a tech stars. They're like a tech yeah. company combined with a business accelerator. They are there to help you build your own business. So if you have an idea, uh, just start talking to them as early as possible. Sure. And something you didn't explicitly mention or didn't underscore was how quick a lot of this process is, especially when you contrast it with traditional game development. A lot of traditional games can take months or years to develop. And, you know, just the process of validation of hyper casual games can be far, far quicker. Can you give us a sense of what kind of timelines? that validation process you just described can look like? Sure. So th that, that entire process from kind of submitting a, you know, an idea to launching your game worldwide, that can happen in six to eight weeks. Wow. That just blows people's minds. But for me, again, it's, it's super exciting. Uh, we'll talk about where this is going to go. But for me, that has implications on basically if you're a content marketer, and you're thinking about where can I quickly execute marketing campaigns, yeah. hyper casual can compete with how long it takes to create a TV ad, for example, yeah. let alone other categories of like uh, games that could take 12, 18, 24 months to develop and uh, off you go. I, I just think that six to eight weeks and the amount that is happening behind the, the scenes is just incredible. One of the things that contributes to the massive success of hyper casual games as you touched upon earlier is the massive scale of user acquisition that is possible with hyper casual it's oftentimes i've seen economics that are an order of magnitude better than casual games or other genres of games when, when you compare hyper casual versus other genres what would you say contributes to this order of magnitude differential in efficiencies this could be cost of acquiring a user but, the CP, uh, but also an IPM, and you can touch upon why that's important and what contributes to this sort of massive differential in economics. Again, in kind of simple economic terms, hyper casual games are a commodity. It's a product with a, an addressable global market. Uh, and each hyper casual game it's effectively doesn't significantly differ from others that have preceded it. You see some great games that are very quickly copied. So that, that's why for hyper casual sort of precise targeting, it's not necessarily as important as, as a low CPI because the, the people that we're trying to acquire could be pretty much anyone who hasn't played a mobile game regardless of age of income. So for me, it really, you hear, you've mentioned it already, you hear sort of IPM, so installs per thousand impressions talked about a lot in the world of hyper casual. Um, so you need the lowest CPI, the highest conversion, and therefore you need a high IPM. So you want as many as possible to lower the CPI. So, yeah. so Iron Source released some figures on this, and to put it into perspective, in casual games, you might see an IPM of around four, so four installs for every thousand impressions, versus a, a top hyper casual game, you might see an IPM of forty. Yeah. So that that's ten x. So that's why hyper casual. Um, can buy users with a lower CPI versus a, a casual game and still get the same eCPM in the waterfall that we're, we're bidding on. Sure. So that's why you've seen this explosion of hyper casual in the charts because we can compete with any other big game launches so long as the, the maths back out. Yeah. And it's, it's fascinating talking to friends that work in other genres of games the impact that these hyper casual launches are having on their own game launches because 
they can just go up and just launch and cannibalize a market buying yeah. it. We're talking like 10, 15, 20 cent CPI versus one to five to ten dollar CPIs that yeah. other gaming companies may be buying to, to, to help you understand. It really comes down to that yeah. IPM number. Yeah, and you touch upon why that IPM is 10 times what a casual game maker can achieve. To put it differently, if a casual game or a strategy game were to say, I'm going to mimic hyper casual creators exactly, and they're going to be inspired by what you've done, and I'm sure at least somebody would have tried that, would they be able to achieve that sort of IPM? I'm trying to understand what about the ad creatives results in like a 10x differential. Hyper casual, you precisely know the LTV and CPI that we need to hit to break even on yeah. day seven. Okay. Versus like a, a mid core title, which you may allow like half a year to break even. So as a result, the way that you deal with channels is is totally different. So you know, if you've got a mid core game, you might invest a bunch of money in in Facebook, for example, come back in six months time, and then you can start figuring out <laughs> all your different cohorts and adjust CPIs, etc. But in hyper casual, we just don't have that luxury thing that we do is based around user level impression revenue data. So we know the exact value of user A versus user B. We know the exact value that we're willing to bid on a user, not just by ad network, but by a specific app and a placement within that app, if, let's say iron source. So it's the level of sophistication that we can apply, but with the advantage that we just know we know the answer to the sum that we're trying to achieve up front. We don't have to wait six months to figure it out. And then on your point in terms of creative for hyper casual, generally it's sort of video playable ads specifically that are driving most of the revenue. And you'll see how drastically different they are creatively compared to other genres because you are effectively playing the game. You would see no difference from a playable ad versus the game versus if you look at a lot of, ads for like say triple a games the ad you're watching almost looks like a movie and then you go play the game and it's like hang on a minute that doesn't look anything like yeah what you've just advertised so i think that closeness between the ad creative and the game itself also res results in a much higher install rate versus perhaps other genres yeah so in some sense the sheer simplicity of hyper casual games leads to very close correspondence in the ad versus the game itself, which I imagine can result in the tremendously high performance. And of course, like you said, that married with this very, very granular data, even at the user level, lets you target and acquire these users much, much more effectively. Right? That's what it sounds like it's happening. Yeah. Since you do seem to have that granular level of data, would you say that programmatic channels become much more effective for hyper casual what's been your experience with programmatic i also ask because uh, being able to crack programmatic i understand is very heavily dependent on having very granular data so you can bid for new impressions basically based on the users and the propensity to make future revenue for you and since you have that level of understanding i would imagine programmatic you would be in a very bad position to capitalize on i'm curious what your perspective has been on programmatic and what your experience have been on the one hand we are in a very strong position because thanks to you know the likes of tengen and iron source and mopub we're able to make every impression count and aggregate vast amounts of data coming in from you know different network supply sources and analyze everything from demand source ad placement currency country etc when it comes to pr programmatic, so having all of that, that, that data should be a great place to start. But there, at, at times when we've been testing various DSPs, there is a pricing problem. If you think about the CPIs that we are typically looking to acquire users at, you know, 10 cents, 20 cents, obviously varies by country. A lot of, C a lot of DSPs typically are asking for, let's say, like a dollar minimum when it comes to sort of acquisition costs. So that at times can be a problem because the basic math don't work. So a lot of the acquisition is still being done manually, but automated with a lot of ad networks and 
influencer marketing companies and social platforms like, like TikTok. And I think the other challenge, we, we've, we've certainly tested a few, and I, I've got my eye on a couple of startups in this space, but I, I think the way it's going when I look at colleagues in other gaming genres that are successfully deploying programmatic. I think where we're going to land in hyper casual is uh, working with some of these startups that are offering effectively a bidder as a service that we can start feeding all of our campaign data through that's linked to our cost aggregation platform, uh, our analytics suite, and doing something a little bit more custom rather than just kind of taking a seat on one of the bigger, I would say, you know, there are some great DSPs out there, but they're probably built for brand. And then some of the more performance DSPs we've also tested, but still, I don't think uh, for now, we still are probably a lot more heavily working with ad network social platform versus having picks like one DSP and funneling all of our buying through, through a DSP. And that certainly seems like an opportunity for the right company. And if, you know, did mention that you have your eyes on a couple of companies that could be capitalized, poised to capitalize on this. Definitely something that I'm curious about and, and definitely something I'm going to be keeping an eye, eye open for. Yeah. So, John, you've worked on a lot of games. You've just seen this category emerge just over the last couple of years to a very, very significant size. What have you seen recently that has surprised you about hyper casual? It could just could be either with regard to a specific game mechanic or the way data is used. What, what, what surprised you recently? I think what's what surprised the industry is, to your point, how, how hyper casual just keeps going because people just think it's going to just disappear. And it's not going to disappear. I think it's just going to evolve. So I think what surprised me and excites me is coming from the developer community, the, the way that you've got different genres of developers that have never built a hyper casual game, but bringing their knowledge from casual, from I met a great developer that builds puzzle based games, but have this actually kind of study physics at university. Yeah. I'm getting really excited about how we can start bringing a great gameplay and depth to hyper casual games. That if we fast forward 12 months, I'd like to believe there's going to be a really strong category of hyper casual games that look very different to, to what you see now. Sure. Yeah. I think the speed at which our technology partners are moving is incredible. So we've already discussed a little bit about sort of our obsession with like impression level revenue data, but I think yeah. it's going to go like a step further as it were. So yeah. it's not just about a specific network and placement and creative. I think what we're getting these discussions are already happening, but actually seeing linking all of our user acquisition monetization data and bringing it even earlier and tying it to specific changes that we're able to make in a certain country when it comes to, wow. to gameplay. So again, everything we do is powered by data, but actually an even earlier stage to be able to tie just the slightest change to game design to, you know, that bottom right hand corner on our spreadsheet in terms of net profit per inf install, for example, I think we will get to that point where yeah. we can, measure absolutely everything sure. that we're doing directly tied to net revenue net profit sure and certainly i think that level of granularity i can see how that's set to advance this also reminds me one of the developments that's happened in the last couple of months which also ties into the idea of cross-pollination that you touched upon is that one of the bigger players in the hyper casual game space today is someone that started off as an ad network, uh, it's AppLab and Lion Studios. So they were basically in the ad tech space and they are among the big, bigger makers of hyper casual games today, right? So, which to me was surprising at the time, but it's increasingly understandable given the size of the hyper casual market. How does an ad tech company coming into the gaming space impact someone like you? That's also looking to do deals with the, this particular ad tech company. So you're clearly competing against somebody that's potentially buying on the entry. How do you look at this particular development? Do you see more crossover like this happening as you go forward? Do you think this is good for the space? Yeah, there's lots of elements in that if we unpick them. So yeah. uh, I think if you look at hyper casual now, and certainly when we launched OMA, this was very much in our thinking. So there's kind of two types of publishers. There's 
publishers that hyper casual publishers that purely just focus on the ad side, right? Just UA monetization. Yeah. And there's others that then focus on the other side. It's all about game design and the game art that then kind of fuels and make the ads ad piece a lot more effective. So I think if you look at what Adam and the team have done an incredible job is they fuse the two, right? They've got their, their yeah. games publishing arm in terms of Lion, but then they also have this incredible user acquisition platform to then publish their games on. We use AppLovin, they're a great partner, but there are also some other, you know, if you think about Iron Source and their recent valuation, it's a yeah. similar size in terms of market cap as, as AppLovin. The team at Snap, actually, for our first launch into Idle with Idle World, they were one of the top performing partners. So I don't think if you don't own your own kind of ad network that you're a disadvantage, but I think this new breed, and as I said, when we built Oma, we wanted to build this blend of not ad tech, but a technology business that has automation at the heart of everything it does, of which kind of user acquisition monetization is part of that. But also blending it with a business accelerator, because if you think about the lifeblood, the oxygen of hyper casual, it is developers, you know, whether you're doing it in-house or partnering. And what these developers really need is their own tech stars they are running their own business so they need someone that's got their best interests at heart that's going to help them grow that's going to be able to plug them into their own kind of data analytics suite to help them design better games so i certainly don't think you're at a disadvantage if you don't have that the other element in there of course is well where are you most likely to acquire a hyper casual user it's from other hyper casual games so uh, obviously, Lion have a great suite of games, but there are lots of uh, other uh, hyper casual studios, publishers that we acquire users from. They're acquiring users from our games. It's no different to you know any, any other genre, right? Where you're going to acquire a player that, that likes RPG games, other RPG games. So that element is nothing new. Yeah. But what I expect to see happening is in this sort of automation tech stack that this new era of hyper casual publishers are building out having their own in-house competencies so back to the last point about programmatic having your own in-house competencies and way of doing user acquisition is going to be a key differentiator yeah. so you know it's, it's as with anything we have access to the same networks as all the other publishers but it's yeah. going to be about how we can neatly tie together everything right. we're doing bring in you know we have our own dmp in-house so it's not just about having that data, but how are all the tools that we have built on top of partners like Tengen, Game Analytics, Mopub Iron Source, how can we then execute yeah. on that more effectively than you know, the team at Lion? Sure, and that also speaks to the level of sophistication that you alluded to in your data and how you use data for, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah, John, and how do you see hyper-casual evolve and mature over the next couple of years, you know, because 860 million MAU is huge. So where, where do you see this going from here? So I think, again, some people are saying it's, it's going to shrink. I actually see a lot of green pasture ahead. So if we look at China, you know, roughly 800 million mobile phone users, 240 iOS and the rest Android, you know, right now, China has been a tricky market with the ever-changing government legislation, locking down licenses for nine months and they opened up and they closed it again. Not necessarily a problem for hyper-casual, more affecting IP-based games, but that said, the legislation is still being defined. So for me, if you think, you know, China iOS is the same size as roughly the US and it's still early stage, I just see a huge amount of growth in China, in Asia. We're also hearing lots of rumors about certain companies outside of hyper casual that have got aspirations to move into hyper casual but one that i know is moved into hyper casual is bike dance so again the more you have these huge tech companies with things like you know tiktok in their armory moving into hyper casual yeah. you're just going to see more great games in the market and particularly given the complexities and the uniqueness of certainly the chinese ua market not to mention it's like 50 different android app stores to start with in china i think the more you're going to start to see, you know, chart topping hyper casual games in that market is going to bring more and more of the Chinese user base online. So that really excites me. Yes, you might see some stagnation or decreased level of growth in Western markets, but 
as I said, Asia is very interesting. We spoke about it earlier, how UA and monetization tools are going to continue to develop, give even more depth in terms of what and how we can measure what exactly everything that's happening in our games is really exciting. We spoke earlier about the investment money moving in. We're seeing more global game studios moving into hyper casual. So if you think back to 2016 with Ubisoft, the Catch App more recently, they acquired the idol studio Green Panda. We've got Netmarble being fairly loud, trying to move into the hyper casual space. You've got Tabtail, you've got Gizmart. Um, and, and for me, it makes sense purely yeah. from a business perspective because yeah. You have a great overlap between hyper casual and casual players in terms of players that also play IP based games. So versus every time you launch a new title, spending $5 to acquire new, new users. If you have a hyper casual studio in your portfolio, well, with the level of detail we have, you know that exact tipping point where someone is you know, migrating from hyper casual games to IP based games. So I just see M&A in this space and the big studios as a, a really smart user acquisition play, completely separate to the team and technology you'll be acquiring that I think you can absolutely apply to your kind of casual UA stack. And then again, we touched on it earlier, but I just see hyper casual as a mass marketing channel. So I honestly believe in a couple of years time, if I'm Universal Pictures, and I've got a new movie launching, well, alongside creating a TV spot in every single market, yeah. for a very low cost and within six to eight weeks i can have a mass market hyper casual game slash tv ad out there around the world exposed to millions of millions of consumers not gamers consumers yeah. i can just see hyper casual just almost if i go back to my agency days it's just going to be on the media plan it's just like buying your out of home tv yeah. I think brands are already spending heavily in, in terms of rewarded video. We see a lot of brand performance ads in our games, but I just think the way brands are now going to start embracing hyper casual is similar to you know, how they've jumped into esports, for example. So that really excites me as well. Wow. Yeah. And that just given the sheer scale that hyper casual's already attained, doesn't surprise me as to the outlook you see for hyper casual over the years ahead. I'm absolutely excited to follow along and, of course, to see what you do, John. I do know we're, we're coming up on time. So as we wrap, I would love for you to tell our listeners a bit more about how they can find out more about you, how they can find out about Oma Games. You can find us in the App Store under Oma Games, H-O-M-A Games. You can see our current portfolio of live games. You can check out the team on LinkedIn. We've got a team of kind of 30 plus people in Paris, which is our HQ, a really great, talented and multicultural team powering all of our hit games. You can find various podcasts or YouTube videos of the team speaking at different events. And, you know, feel free to just reach out and find me on LinkedIn and whatever aspect of you know, hyper casual games you want to talk about from how do I get into it? As a, from a developer's perspective to, you know, you, you've already got a game and you want some help in terms of publishing or anyone from the investment community that really wants to understand the hyper casual landscape and how to navigate it, the kind of questions to ask. We get a lot of inbound activity from potential investors and larger M&A teams at studios wanting to find out more. So super happy to chat to anyone that just wants to learn more about hyper casual games, you know, hit me up on LinkedIn. And I'm sure there'll be a link from the podcast to yeah. my details. So just drop yeah. your line. Wonderful, John. Yes, of course. We'll link to your website, your games, your LinkedIn in the show notes to this podcast. But for now, I know we've come up on time. So I want to say thank you for taking the time to be on the show. We really appreciate you taking the time. I'm very, very excited to put this out into the world very soon. Thank you, John. For more tips pointers and strategies from the leading edge of mobile user acquisition. Subscribe to our YouTube channel right here or check out our blog rocketshiphq.com slash blog.